Welcome to the Film Florida podcast. I'm John Lux, and I'm the executive director of Film Florida. Before we get to our interview, please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the Film Florida podcast. If you're not already a member of Film Florida, please consider joining at filmflorida.org. If you like what you hear on the podcast, please consider going to our website and donating $20.22 for our 2022 fundraising campaign. We also have a Film Florida merchandise page. Visit filmflorida.creator-spring.com to purchase Film Florida t-shirts, sweatshirts, coffee mugs, and more. Jennifer Aspen is an actress, writer, and producer. As an actor, she has close to 100 credits to her name. She was a series regular on Party of Five, had a recurring role on Glee, and was a lead in the ABC series GCB. Additionally, she had guest roles on Beverly Hills 90210, Married with Children, Will and Grace, Friends, Grey's Anatomy, CSI, and Criminal Minds, just to name a few. More recently, she's turned her attention to writing and producing, including being the executive producer of five movies for the Hallmark Channel. We talked to Jennifer about all of that and more on this episode of the Film Florida Podcast. Here's my conversation with Jennifer Aspen. Welcome to the Film Florida Podcast, Jennifer. Thank you. I'm so excited to be on this podcast. Well, I'm such a Florida fan. You. Excellent. <laughs> um, so uh, give us your origin story. Where did you come from? Do you mean birth or within <laughs> the entertainment industry? <laughs> well, let's start. Let's start. Where were you? Where were you born? Where were you raised? Uh, you know, th- those type of things. OK, well, I was born in Richmond, Virginia and lived there for a while. And then my parents, who are college educators, so that moved them around a little bit for jobs, then went to Prescott, Arizona, very small rodeo town in Arizona, where I spent my childhood and then uh, moved to Santa Cruz, California for my teenage years and then went to UCLA for college and uh, had been in LA ever since until recently. Well, and I'm guessing that somewhere in that UCLA area is how you kind of found your way into the industry. So tell us kind of the the entry path to, to the entertainment industry. All right. Well, I will say that there's sort of two, two tracks for me. And one is finding performing and one is finding how you get paid for performing. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and I found performing in high school, doing a high school musical. I ended up in the lead, um, a lead in how to succeed in business without really trying. And I ended up auditioning by accident because I was in detention and they were practicing the dance for the audition. And someone said, you'd be really good in this. You should audition. And I said, what's an audition? What? And they walked me through it. And I ended up with that role. And that moment, I will never forget performing on stage for the first time for a live audience with the lights and everything. And that's when I found my moment of performing as a love and joy and what I was meant to do. And then from there on, I didn't realize because my family wasn't really a TV movie family. They're scientists, actually. Okay. Um, my father was a botanist and my mother, a herpetologist, which is reptiles and amphibians, not herpes, as some people think. <laughs> so I didn't realize that people made money performing at all until someone said, oh, uh, no, you can apply to schools and have that be your major, theater, film, and television. And I was shocked to hear that, that that was a serious venture. So then I got into UCLA, theater, film, and television. I do have a bachelor's degree and was on the Dean's list, just to brag about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And from there, because it was in LA, you're correct. People were working in the industry that were students at UCLA and Jack Black was one of them. (laughs) It's just... (laughs) You know, and they, they were on shows and things were happening for them. And, and so someone, you know, helped me to get an agent. And then my first professional job was another stage play, The Lion in Winter. I played Princess Alice at the Pasadena Playhouse, which was, I think it was like a 900 seat theater. And I thought I was loaded. Oh, I, I mean, I was making... I think I was making $600 a week. <laughs> I was like, I can quit my job at Louise's. I've made it. And uh, that was my first paying job. And then from there, you just, 
people come to see you in the show and then you get an audition from that. And the more you perform, especially in Los Angeles, even if it's on a stage, the more you get opportunities to audition for film. And then my first television series, my first job was a sitcom, Hope and Gloria. I was so nervous Mm -hmm. and they were so lovely and walked me through all of that. And I kept that job, which was great. And then my first television series was called um, Claude's Crib. Ahead of its time, it was a um, multicultural friends sitcom. And it was yeah. really, really fun. And that was my first time. But I started working in my 20s and never stopped. Right. Well, and some of your early acting credits on IMDb are, are really classic shows. Uh, Beverly Hills 90210, Married with Children. Do you remember how you got those roles and remember anything about being on, on those series? Oh, so much. Yes. Especially when you say 90210, because I think that was my second job wow. ever. And I got the job and it was at the height of 90210. Which was crazy. crazy. Yeah. Crazy. And again, I wasn't really a TV watcher. I know that sounds crazy, but I, I, I wasn't, I was aware of the craze, but I wasn't watching 90210. And I got uh, to play this part opposite Luke Perry. (laughs) Um, And I was so nervous. This was only my second job. And I had to make out with him all day long. Um, And he was the loveliest person. He also took such good care of me. He could see how nervous I was. And he was so attentive and such a gentleman when he passed. I was so devastated because he meant so much to the beginning of my career and setting a great example of how to be on set with others that are new. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it was, it was, and then my friends were, I said, I made out with Luke Perry all day today. And they're like, (laughs) Uh, but it was very special to be uh, a part of that at the time. And, Married with children was the same. And, and I, I think, you know, as you're having me look at it right now, what I realize is these beginning jobs, like married with children was one of my first few jobs. And Christina Applegate took such great care of me. She was so lovely to me on set and David Faustino was as well, but she really was so complimentary and lovely. And, and when I did friends, Jennifer Aniston took such great care of me and was so lovely, complimentary. And I feel like I was really lucky at the beginning of my career to have be on these shows at the height of their fame. And somehow there was a person there that recognized that I was new. I didn't really know what I was doing and they took great care of me. I feel really fortunate about that experience. That's great. And now you're on a number of series in the mid-1990s before landing a series regular role on Party of Five. How did that role come about? And what do you remember about being on an important part of that series? You know, I just auditioned for that role was supposed to recur. It was supposed to just be uh, like four to five episodes. And so I auditioned just like everybody you know, nothing, nothing special about that. Just did it and ended up with the role. And, um, Matthew Fox, who I played off opposite on that. Uh, and I got along so well and I (laughs) talking about myself, like I'm so great, but (laughs) I think I brought, cause I came in, I want to say that was the end of the fourth season, um, or end of the fifth. And I feel like I brought a new kind of life into his world, certainly. And it really expanded that joy for him. And we, I had one of the funnest days of my life, you know, with him on one of these episodes. So I, the, just the joy of acting and performing was so great. And then they made it into a series regular, which I did for two years, the last two years of the show. And they wrote so exquisitely for me. It was so, I was so fortunate. And then again, I was kind of, you know, for me first is performance and story. And then around it was, oh, this is a major show. (laughs) It's like a major thing. And so, you know, when I did my first red carpet, 
being um, an important character on that show, it exploded, you know, the carpet, ex- you walk onto it and it's like, yeah, you know, all of that. And it's, it's this explosion. And I was like, wow, just, it was, it was really something. And then, you know, we would film sometimes in San Francisco on the streets and there would be all these women and they would, you know, approach Scott and Matthew, like they were the second coming. It was mm-hmm. unbelievable. Uh, and when we would go to, you know, New York and do press and it, it just gave me great joy, I guess, that I would have these young girls run up and go, oh my gosh, Daphne. And they would just be so thrilled to see me. And that was thrilling for me that that gave them joy. Yeah, <laughs> just, no, that I makes love, sense. That's what, yeah, that's what I loved about being on that show is the quality of it, the beauty of what the storytelling, and then that it really mattered to our audience what we were doing special. And then over the next decade, you had guest roles on a number of great television series. You mentioned uh, being on Friends, also Will and Grace, Grey's Anatomy, Boston Legal, CSI, Criminal Minds, just to name a few. Was there a project or two or, or a specific experience in that kind of time that stands out, uh, you know, for you? I'm just like, I'm going over all those experiences and each one had something really special to it. I think because I have been fortunate to play character roles, even as a leading lady, you know, so there's something interesting about each thing. And, you know, Grey's Anatomy was so special also, you know, at a huge moment in time. And what I remember most about that was Patrick Dempsey really liked his hair to look good. I remember that. (laughs) (laughs) And he had just bought a great sports car. Um, and, you know, that was the writing on that was so, so special. And I just, I'm sorry, my dog is loves it's to. Qu- it's okay. Bark. And I'm two floors up from where he is. That's how loud <laughs> his bark is. Um, I think uh, God, CSI, I did two episodes of that. And that was just really fun because that budget so huge. So the production value is so good. I did Vanilla Sky with Tom Cruise in mm. that time frame with Cameron Crowe and you know uh I ended up getting cut out of that movie I knew I would because there was this party scene and I had this scene with Tom and then Cameron got inspired to add this other character to walk in in the middle of the scene and she really blew it over and over and over again and and there's no way to cut around her the way they were shooting was like Mm -hmm going around is like this. And I'm like, the scene is going and going in the trash. (laughs) (laughs) But that one really stood out to me because I don't even know what that budget was. It was a massive budget. And Tom Cruise was, is such an everybody in the business will tell you this. And you've probably heard this a million times. This guy is so generous and takes such great care of you. He's a producer on that film as well. We got trailers we weren't supposed to have. We were supposed to have much smaller ones and we were given double bangers and he, they didn't have to spend that money, but they did. And every day was another, you know, an in and out truck or, you know, a coffee truck or mm-hmm. all just complimentary of, of Tom. And when you work with him, he is so engaged and just, it's like, there's this power about him as a producer and a performer and that that really stood out to me like I, when I when I'm a producer I want to treat people this well because it made on the receiving end of it made me feel so good and it made me want to work harder and the crew mm-hmm. felt that way everyone felt that way that really stands out to me doing that movie yeah that's a great a great lesson and then in 2009 you were cast as, in a cur- recurring role on Glee and I remember when, when Glee came out, I thought it was an interesting concept. Uh, I actually, going back to the production value, I thought, wow, that's an expensive television series. And you were part of season one. As you were filming some of those early episodes, did you have any idea how Glee would just explode? Yeah, I knew Glee was special the moment I got the script. And originally I tested to play uh, the, the sister. I was I originally tested to to do a series regular role. And it was one of the best auditions of my life. And the 
studio network test, people came from their offices to see it that didn't have to be there because of what I was doing in that room. It was so special. And Ryan Murphy um, fell in love with me. Is that a good way to say it? <laughs> he, but at that point in time, he, he didn't, have, um, didn't have the power he has now. And one person at Fox said no to me playing that role. But I knew, but it was so special just from the pilot script of going through that for that particular role. I was like, this is special. You, you could tell there was really something about it. It, you know, it, it elevated you as a performer, the way it was written. Mm -hmm. And so I knew I was devastated and shocked when I didn't end up with that, that particular role. So Ryan, uh, bless him wrote me that role that I ended up doing Kendra Giardi because mm -hmm. he wanted me in, in that show. So I recurred on the, that seminal season, which is those first two, 10 episodes, which is what won all the awards. And you did know, you really did know. And I, I could, I can't put my finger on it, but when we were filming it, everyone felt that way. And all the kids, you know, and, you know, tragically, things have happened since then to some of them, but at mm -hmm. that time they were so innocent and lovely. And, you know, Corey was Corey, like what he seems like on screen. He, he was, you know, this tall, sweet guy and everyone felt an electricity. I would say when you would, you know, walk around between scenes and someone had just come from rehearsal. I didn't get, a I didn't get a musical number, but okay. But, you know, <laughs> they would come from rehearsal and you would cross going into film and all our trailers, you know, of course we're around each other. And so we, you know, how did that go? Oh my God, it was so great. And, and it had that energy to it. Um, so yes, I knew we were filming something special. I couldn't wait for people to see it. And we were done filming those 10 before it was released. Oh, okay. Right. So we'd done it. It was in the can. It was like, how's this going to go? And then it just exploded, you know, and all the award shows and all that. I was, I was one episode short of getting a SAG award for that. <laughs> oh, it was so heartbreaking. They gave me a piece of paper that said I got an honor. There you go. Well, <laughs> but, that, I guess, I guess that's something. <laughs> yeah. But, but we could definitely tell that it was a very special time. And from a production standpoint, how different was Glee than any other series you had been on because of those musical performances? I mean, there were so many stages that were needed because the rehearsals had to be on the sound stage next to it so that once we were done filming here and moved out, they could move in and film. But it wasn't egregious. It's like it didn't feel that there was endless money. Cause again, this was like an experiment for them mm -hmm. almost. Right. Right. So they threw money at it, but it wasn't like, you know, we were having crab legs for lunch. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it wasn't like the trailers that first season were the best you could get. So at that time, it was really just more about keeping the money they were spending on the screen and without a ton of extras. Yeah. Uh, so it was, I, I'm sure, because I, I didn't go back again, even though I was going to, but then it really sort of took a turn on the storylines and went towards the teens so much more than the adults. Yep. So I didn't end up coming back, though that was originally the intention. I'm sure as they went along, all of that grew immensely. But at the time, it was really just you know, choreographers and rehearsals and spending the money on things that people were going to see. Yeah, that makes sense. And then uh, after that, in 2012, you starred in an ABC series called GCB, along with some really great actors like Kristen Chenoweth, mm -hmm. David James Elliott, Annie Potts, and others. The series only lasted one season, but I remember it specifically, and it was a lot of fun. Oh my gosh, we had so much fun. I've starred in seven television series and that was my seventh one. And aside from party of five, that one, the fans everywhere we went mm -hmm. loved that show. There was such a response to it and it was very exciting. And Kristen Chenoweth and I totally fell in love at our very first table read in Dallas, Texas, at the Ritz Carlton hotel, I think we were at. And 
it was a role that I dreamed of playing and, and the fashion and, and Annie Potts, we are still good friends. And Kristen and I are, you know, doing projects together still, because we just love being around each other. Marisol Nichols has become a really close friend of mine. Um, you know, so we made these great friendships and Miriam Shore. Oh my gosh, what a talent. I was having the time of my life. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was probably my favorite series experience was that show. And th- that was sort of a, came to a, a tragic end. I know you, you didn't um, ask me this question, but you know, we were, we were sort of the OG cancel culture show. Mm. And it was really unfortunate because as we see in current events, it takes so little for an entire group to come against you. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, you know, GCB was based on a book called Good Christian Bitches. Okay. And that book was written by a woman named Kim Gatlin, who is a devout Christian. And she wrote that book um, with the point of view of basically making fun of, you know, women that weren't really following. They'd go to church on Sunday, but they didn't act like it the rest of the week. Okay. And so that was her point. And our showrunner uh, was Baptist, Bobby Harling. And Kristen Chenoweth is a devout Christian who really understands her Bible. And it was never made, and I would never be a part of, something that was trying to make fun of Christians at all. Right. Not at all. But it was taken that way. Uh, um, because people you know, don't always know the context in cancel culture. They know a sentence. Right. So what ended up happening which was smart of this group called 1 million moms, which is not 1 million moms. I hear they have about like a 30,000 subscription email list. (laughs) They started targeting our advertisers, our blue chip advertisers. This was a very expensive show. You can see from the talent that was on it, um, Darren Starr, Bobby Harling, you know, big producers, everybody getting paid. And we had uh, four sound stages on the Disney lot. So it wasn't cheap. Right. Um, so they targeted our, our blue chip advertisers and everybody pulled except Subway. And we didn't even know it was happening. Yeah. We didn't even know it was happening. So it became financially unable to move forward because we were, we were essentially, we were canceled, cancel culture canceled. And, um, I'm still, um, Kim, Kim Gatlin, who wrote the book, I have the rights to the book. I have a plan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have actresses on board. Um, the, sh- the show is just supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be fun. Yeah, it's just supposed to be fun. We're just supposed to, you know, poke fun at all of our sillinesses. And anyway, I have plans. It's not. It's not gone. Just good. Good. <laughs> so then, after that, over the next decade, you continue to act, but you also started producing and writing, and you've been the executive producer on five movies for the Hallmark Channel. Was that a natural evolution of your career, or was there something along the way where a light bulb went off and said, "Wait, I want to do this now"? How, how did that all come about? Yeah, um, I was filming a movie in. Richmond, Virginia, where I was born. It was the first time I'd gone back to Richmond, Virginia since, you know, we had left when I was a toddler and I was in my hotel room and I was listening to a song and I got an idea for a story. It hit me like I had goosebumps and I just was like, oh my gosh. And I wrote it down. And at the time my husband was, um, and still does, but he was doing starring in a lot of movies for Hallmark. His name is David O'Donnell. And he said, you know, I was in a, I was a van ride back from the set with some of the Hallmark producers who were like, we really need stories. And I said, well, I just came up with a story and he goes, oh, it's perfect for them. I should set something up. (laughs) (laughs) And I sold that movie and we made it. It was my first movie. (laughs) And I, it was, 
it was interesting because it didn't come from now I'm going to be a producer. It came from my love of telling stories, which is where I act from. Mm -hmm. I act from that place too. That's what they've all been. And, and, but I will say that what I enjoyed so much on that first movie, which was difficult because my, actually my husband helped executive produce it with me. Thank goodness. Cause I had to leave early to go uh, film sharp objects for HBO okay. uh, with Jean-Marc Ballet, also a brilliant life taken too soon. Uh, anyway, um, at that time, I thought I loved the process because it's a service oriented process for me. Okay. And what I mean by that is I'm trying to help every department uh, get to this vision and encourage them and get us there and deliver a movie that the network is blown away by and makes them happy. That's kind of a recurring theme in my career. It really makes me happy to have others be really happy. So that was the transition to executive producing. And then I just loved it. And the movie did really well out of the gate. They were like, who is this person? What this movie? I'm crying in this movie. I'm not supposed to cry. What the heck? Mm -hmm. So it really um, impinged on a lot of the executives there. And that gave me other opportunities to bring forth other stories. Well, and when you are looking at a new project, whether you're writing, producing, executive producing, what is it that you're looking for in a story that kind of hooks you when, when you say, yeah, I want to be part of this? Um, I'm a, an emotional person. Uh, I, I want to say a positively emotional person, which is to okay. say, um, a beautiful song will make me cry. A beautiful story will, I will feel that story. Mm -hmm. It will get me right, right in my chest, in my stomach. I'll have goosebumps. And that's when I know a story's for me. It means something to me. It hits me. And that can be something that I come up with and I'm really passionate about, or it can be something that I read and I go, I've got to, I've got to tell the story. That's what hooks me is that feeling where it really means something to me emotionally. And so what's next for you? Where, where can we see either you in front or behind the camera? I have so many projects in development right now that I wake up at four in the morning stressed about how none of them are getting all the attention that they need. Okay. That sounds <laughs> um, about right. Yeah. and. So I don't know at this point, because, you know, we've had obviously a really weird two years mm -hmm. and, um, and things, you know, I, I thought we'd be shooting a um, series that I uh, came up with. I thought we'd be starting that last year and maybe that'll happen this year. And then this two mo other movies like this is me this is a calendar and it's rotating forward because things change so fast in this environment mm -hmm. so I don't know which one's going to pop first because my goal is I want to be Taika Waititi <laughs> that's my goal I want to do <laughs> I want to do all the things and so as I I kind of um you know I'm acting and producing but producing for a few years certainly was taking much more of my attention because it's a great job mm -hmm. and I'm not waiting for somebody else to say, Oh, there's a job for you. And so the goal has always been to learn that job really well, prove myself. So people know I can trust her with a movie and then insert myself as an actor as well and have those things happen at the same time. And that has been uh, building so these projects I have at least half of them I'm also you know the third or fourth lead in and so you'll to answer your question you will see me soon but I don't know which one of these is going to come to the four first I did last spring executive produce and star in a movie for Hallmark called you had me at Aloha which since we're coming up on this summer that'll replay a bunch that's a, mm -hmm. I'm really proud of that movie I'm really proud of how I developed that script and, and what we shot. Lo love that movie. And then I filmed a movie in December, November, December, that I was just an actor in. Sorry. I filmed a movie that I was just an actor in at that time. 
which was really hard. <laughs> <laughs> Because all I wanted to do, like, God forbid, I looked at the monitor because I would just be like, oh, wait, they have to move that Christmas tree. Uh But I don't know uh, where that will end up. It's a Christmas movie. So obviously we won't, you won't see me in that till the end of this year. They'll sell it somewhere. And my Uh husband stars in that movie, David O'Donnell. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that that's coming up. And then out of all these other things, it is a mystery to me, which is going to come first, but it's coming. You'll see more of me. It'll be annoying. Probably. (laughs) (laughs) I doubt that. And uh, you know, do you have a website, social media, if people want to keep up or follow you, go ahead and plug away. Yeah. I think the best place is Instagram and that's at Jennifer C Aspen, because apparently there was a Jennifer Aspen that beat me to it. So I had to stick that C in there. I think that's the best place. I am on Twitter as well, though I'm not as active on Twitter anymore. And I have a website, but I feel like it's really a placeholder. It's jenniferaspen.com. But I think that if you really want to see my thoughts and uh, hear about what I'm thinking about things or what I'm up to, that the Instagram is the best one. Excellent. Well, Jennifer, I know you're busy and I really appreciate you making time to be on the Film Florida podcast. And separately, I really appreciate the outside the recording conversations that we've had over the last couple of months. It's been really great to know you and I'm glad we were able to do this for the podcast. Yes, I'm so glad to do the podcast and I as well appreciate our outside conversations. And I also predict that there'll be many more future ones that are really exciting. That's what I think is going to happen. I hope so. Thanks so much for being with us today. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to the Film Florida podcast. For more information about Film Florida, go to filmflorida.org or visit our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. If you're not already a member of Film Florida, please consider joining at filmflorida.org. If you like what you hear on the podcast, please consider going to our website and donating $20.22 for our 2022 fundraising campaign. Check out the Film Florida merchandise at filmflorida.creator-spring.com. And please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast.